for uh, inviting me. Uh, please press uh, recording. Uh, <laughs> accept the recording if you if you are it's okay with you. So this is a joint work with uh, Sanjeev Erath from UC San Diego and Casey Lichtendahl, uh, who was at the University of Virginia at Darden, but recently moved to go full time. Uh, and this paper is under review. Uh, and uh, a preliminary version of this paper uh, was accepted uh, as an extended abstract in uh, in an economics conference, uh, economics and computer science conference. Um, and then this there's this forward to a journal process, and it's currently uh, in the revenue management area of market science. Uh, so because it has some revenue implications. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, innovation contests. If you are not familiar with the setting, very briefly, uh, I want to um, explain this to you. An innovation contest uh, in, in a monopolistic setting, in a traditional setting, uh, you have a firm. The firm has a budget and typically splits the budget into prizes. Uh, so in, in terms of the design, designing the contest, you are thinking about how do you split a given budget that you have with the objective to maximize the best solution as opposed to the total, uh, the total number of solutions. You care about the best. So that's why we call it uh, innovation contest. And this is uh, also related to a paradigm in, in doing innovation. You don't do innovation in-house. You open the boundaries and it's called open innovation because you want to innovate with uh, a much larger uh, setting of uh, of uh, users, let's say. So that's the monopolistic setting. What is different? And in our in our talk, we talk about dueling contests, competing contests. Uh, it's it's very different than uh, you know the monopoly setting for the following reason. If you have a platform, let's say Innocentive, uh, which is uh, now acquired by another company called Zoku Cloud, uh, but Innocentive is a very popular example. Uh, you have uh, this platform where the multiple firms, competing firms with conflicting, competing objectives, they post their own contest, their own innovation contest on the platform. And so these firms have different budgets. They split the budget into prices with the objective of each firm to maximize their own best submitted solution. So uh, the difference is the submitted solution. So you care about the best, but out of which set of the participating set, which is an endogenous set of, uh, so you need, the point we make here is that the way you design your contest does not affect only the actions that these people take upon entering your contest. It also affects who, in terms of who enters your contest, in terms of numbers, in terms of quality. So these are the two uh, ways we are distinct from uh, what we know so far about monopolistic contests. And uh, to motivate the setting, a couple of things to remember is that when you go to Innocentive, you see, or if you don't like Innocentive, think about Kaggle, think about any platform you like uh, that hosts innovation contests. Uh, so you have several firms, AstraZeneca could be an example, or some foundations, uh, they host their own contest. And there's a specific description, and there's some deadline, there's some some uh, you might, there's some information being shared. One thing you observe is that uh, People, solvers, self-select uh, content. You cannot really enforce people, oh, you know, go to that context, or oh, you go to that. So, so people self-select. And you have many contests to, to self-select. Uh, if you think uh, of the of academia, we also self-select which journal uh, we, we submit our papers to, right? And we, we self-select which areas uh, we're working on. So uh, there are some uh, parallels with this set. So we have uh, different contests that attract different number of people. And as, as, as a person, you don't know how many people will end up in the same set contest with you. So when you self-select, you need to account of this strategic participation, strategic uncertainty uh, of, of, of how people self-select a contest. Another thing we, we observe in these uh, platforms is that some uh, companies actually pay uh, be featured high on the on the platform so we'd like to understand why uh, we uh, have so many featured um, contests that highlight uh, the they try to draw attention of of the of this of the users there uh, this is different than recommending products on amazon this, this is this is a platform setting for innovation contests. another uh, motivation is that so these feature contests appear on top and they draw uh, solvers attention 
Another motivation is on the firm side. Uh, what the platforms do is they try to regulate the actions of the of the firms. In particular, they don't let you self-select any any price that you want. So if you are Netflix, uh, Netflix has a very popular example. They organize a contest with one million prize. Uh, they hosted the contest uh, in, 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 in them by themselves. But if Netflix come in and you are a very small firm, you might uh, think that Netflix will attract all the demand. So, well, uh, uh, sorry, yes, for interrupting. Uh, so there's a question. I mean, do people have information about how many others have joined each competition? I, and I asked that. I, I, I guess you already answered to some extent that they can see the number of soldiers, but do they actually know how many are actively working? No, no. So, and 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 if you want to be conservative, uh, we, we are the most conservative. We are looking at the most conservative setting. In 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 in, uh, in practice, you might know. Uh, let's say ten people have already submitted, or fifteen people have already submitted before the deadline. But uh, there is a lot of substantial uncertainty uh, of how many will submit after you. So, if you are close to the deadline of the contest, sure, you might have a very good estimate if the firm decides to share how many people have submitted before you. Uh, but uh, you might, we argue that there is a substantial uncertainty in many settings. You don't know how many people you are competing against. So, uh, and, and this uncertainty is a strategic choice, a strategic uncertainty, which is driven by the choices of the solvers themselves. Uh, so uh, another uh, important uh, motivation for our work is that the platforms regulate firms' budget. In particular, they let, at least in 99Design and many other uh, platforms, uh, platforms let firms self-select among different packages. So uh, they're saying uh, pay uh, 1300 US dollars to go to the platinum uh, design or uh, choose a gold design etc. So why um, why don't they let firms self-select any budget they want? Why do they want to restrict uh, firm choices? And this motivates our research questions. So we're looking at three levels of the system. We're looking, first of all, at the most, uh, the, the micro level, we'll let's say the solvers. How do uh, the solver self-select? Which contest would you want to go to? You have multiple outside options to uh, to choose from. Uh, and, and you don't know what the other solvers will self-select. A, a second uh, level we are looking at system is the firm level. Between firms, how do, as a firm, AstraZeneca, how do you design your contest when there are different competing contests in parallel, different firms uh, that are designed uh, by themselves. So how do you compete with other firms uh, who design contests? And I think at the third level, uh, we also look at the, uh, I would like to contribute a little bit on the, on the platform level. Uh, what kind of budgets would a social planner select? If you care about welfare, this platform to some extent, they care about the welfare of uh, the firms who, who cost contests and the solvers. Uh, because you think about the long-term view of the platform, it's not about uh, make some money now, it's also the welfare. Uh, so do feature contests maximize welfare? And also, uh, because it's also related to matching, how do you, as a platform, what can you do better to match talent, skills of, of, of solvers with uh, needs from the firms? Uh, so we'd like to contribute a little bit on the matching side. So what do we know about this problem? Uh, very briefly, uh, I want to say, I want to make the claim that uh, most of the people who have worked on innovation contests uh, are uh, belonging to the category of, they have looked, how do you design a contest in a, in a monopolistic setting? At least, you know, they have looked at this from various different angles. And the emphasis here is on the, on the plus plus. If you don't see your name, uh, it's on the plus plus. Uh, so most, it's a very large literature in the monopolistic setting. Uh, I personally have worked on uh, how do you design a monopolistic setting when you people have outside options. Uh, uh, perhaps I could, I could add a little bit more uh, papers, but till 2021, uh, this is more or less uh, the picture. Uh, and uh, people in economics uh, and computer science have worked a lot on competing auctions and competing contests. And uh, what is uh, interesting, these are the Journal of Economic Theory papers, Econometrica papers that you see here, games, economic behavior, uh, this kind of papers. Uh, so this problem is, uh, to be short, uh, this problem is very hard problem. Hard, uh, I'm not seeing, I'm not talking about NP hard. Uh, it's hard for me when I, when I worked on this, at least. 
Uh, and there are two known uh, problems uh, with why this problem in general, uh, in its full generality, can be a hard problem. Uh, there's one issue with infinite regress. Uh, when you select, uh, when you design, uh, we, we try to understand the equilibrium in the design of, uh, of, of competing firms. So when you design your contest, uh, this in general would depend on the design of another firm. And then design of the other firm would depend also on your uh, design. So there is a fixed point there on the mechanism space. At the same time, there is a non-known analog to the revelation principle. The revelation principle is simply is a, is a tool to simplify life in auctions, okay? Uh, because we have started away from strategic buyers and sellers equilibrium. Here, because uh, we need to understand the solvers, be able to understand the equilibrium among competing firms. And this paper has to understand uh, what happens between firms and between and at the platform level. We know a lot about solvers. We try to contribute about competing firms and platform. This is the, this is the level of, uh, of focus of this paper. So in short, we don't know much. It's a hard problem for general cases, which uh, which is great because uh, I hope uh, it's fine with you if we make some simplifications of this problem. So I'll start with a very simple example uh, to uh, gain intuition. To actually, this example, uh, if you understand this example, you already get a very good idea of what the paper is about. So we have two firms, uh, and uh, each firm hosting an ideation contest, meaning. Uh, we are asking for ideas to solve a difficult problem. We are two different firms, A and B. Uh, it's, uh, there are four solvers. Each solver is selecting one. Do we go to firm A or do we go to firm B? The firms have different budgets. The, bu the first one, firm A, has better or equal budget than the other. Okay? And once you submit an idea, this idea is a random draw from a distribution Z. Um, I'm assuming the distributions IID across solvers, assuming uh, this distribution are the same, although it doesn't matter for my example. Now, the firms will try to understand a little bit of the price allocation because a big problem, a big research question uh, in innovation context is how do you structure your prices? How many prizes do you set? How do you split your budget into multiple prices? This has been done uh, a lot in uh, monopolistic settings. How about... Uh, what, what prizes would you select when a competitor also uh, chooses their own prizes? So if a competitor has a beta, one minus beta, splits the budget uh, of $1 into a beta, one minus beta, you are alpha, one minus alpha, what alpha would you set given a beta of a competitor? With the objective of maximizing the expected best uh, idea. Is it clear for everyone? So how do solver cells select? Uh, this is the most uh, simplest non-trivial setting because the solvers are assumed exactly symmetric. So uh, if the solvers are exactly symmetric and you cell select uh, one, contest, either left or right, uh, you will, of course, uh, select contest with a probability. Now, to find this probability, if you want to solve an equilibrium, you need to equate the expected utilities, uh, the expected earnings you're going to make by entering one contest versus entering the other. Now, uh, there is this equation uh, that you see on your screen. Uh, how to understand this equation? Let's say on the left-hand side, when, uh, as a solver, when do I get um, the, the price alpha? This is the top price. I get the top price when the other three do not participate. When the other three do not participate, I am the only one then uh, this happens with one minus p independent uh, draw so one minus p to the power of three uh, to the third uh, this is the chance i have no other uh, competitor and then i get alpha uh, in all other cases uh, that, for example this... so, sorry for interrupting a uh, question do solvers have better information about their solution qualities than the platform do they have any information about other solvers skills no, uh, this is the most basic setting. I'm assuming uh, solvers are exactly symmetric. As a solver, uh, I have no way to know how the firm would evaluate my idea. I'm just choosing which contest I would submit an idea. Then the firm evaluates my idea, and then I get a dra random draw from Z. I don't know what the other people will get. But in expectation, 
I, I know the expectation because I know the G, the random draw. Does this answer the question? Yeah, I think like uh, you in the extension, you have a case where solvers have better yeah. information and, uh, right? Yes. Uh, yes, and no, they don't no, have information no. about other solver skills, so that's in the extension. Yes, yes, yes. Th th yeah. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Versin. I will relax uh, this assumption. So right now I'm assuming the most basic setting. People are symmetric. They self-select contest. How do self-select? So uh, and how does what allocation would you select as a firm when a competitor is also also choosing the allocation? I'm assuming firms have uh, different budgets. How does this affect your uh, allocation? So. Um, so you, you look at the expected utilities uh, and you, have, you equate the expected utilities. It turns out that this has a unique solution. And uh, we observe that the entry problem, we cannot solve this even for four uh, solvers. There's no loss from solution. We can easily show that the entry probability P is unique and strictly increases in alpha, in the value that the firm A attaches to the first price for any beta and for any budget of the competitor. What this implies, okay, this means that if you care about participation, you just need to maximize uh, the value that you allocate to the first price. So essentially, you should allocate one price. But uh, the firm does not necessarily care about participation. The firm cares about the expected best participating solution. So this is the objective. It turns out this objective is strictly increasing in P. Uh, you can solve this with a coupling argument. Uh, there's some technical uh, sides, but the idea is that uh, increasing numbers increases the expected best. And of course, you want the maximum participation, and this can, uh, can be achieved uniquely but, uh, by allocating all your budget to the first price. So firm A uh, should uh, set a single winner takes all price, irrespective of the budget of the competitor, irrespective of the noise of the competitor, irrespective of the allocation of the competitor. So it's a strictly, winner takes all is a strictly dominant strategy for firm A. That's very nice because uh, it holds uh, in, a, in quite a general setting in terms of budget and uh, noise. Uh, so the key takeaway is the winner takes all, winner takes all is the unique pure equilibrium uh, in, in price allocation. So there are two kinds of equilibria. There is a firm level equilibria, equilibria and mechanisms. So how do I allocate my budget prices given a competing mechanism of a competitor? Which will induce, so given two uh, price allocations, this will induce equilibrium among solvers. So these are two uh, equilibria we're looking at. Of course, the equilibrium is one, 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 one thing, right? So a single weight actual price maximizes participation in purely noise-driven context. If you just care about noise and ideation. So then the, the key takeaway here is that you should allocate one price. Now, uh, another uh, thing, another result we have is what about the budgets? What budget should you, uh, as a firm, um, allocate to your projects? So if you have the same setting, uh, one uh, thing to, um, one technical contribution of the paper is, instead of looking at uh, the noise distribution G, you should look at the effective noise distribution. The effective noise distribution uh, essentially um, tries to um, cancel out those who don't participate. Uh, so, so essentially, what are the noise terms that uh, the firm one observes? Um, so what is the noise distribution a, a solver is competing against? It's competing against uh, those who enter have a, a noise larger than me. So uh, by uh, thinking of those who don't enter, those who enter and have noise uh, less than me, these are the people I, I, I don't worry about. So this introduces an effective noise distribution uh, and it treats an entrant that loses with certainty. And the, the beauty of this uh, is that we keep the number of entrants fixed at n, if you work with the effective noise distribution, don't worry about uh, these binomial terms that you saw before. So you can simplify the expressions. And uh, now another thing we observe is that we can stochastically order these distributions. So one thing, an easy thing to show is that uh, the uh, noise distribution G 
so Hasli dominates the uh, noise distribution, the effective noise distribution, which means that the uh, presence of a competitor makes firm one worse off, which is kind of obvious. Uh, and we can also show that you have different budgets uh, by making uh, things more equal, which is uh, when buds are equal, you will get each firm will get the same effective noise distribution, which is the central one. But compared to this, uh, the firm with a larger budget is worse off, and the firm with a lower budget is better off. Uh, but uh, we can also, given the stochastic order, the concavity of the objective, we can show that the welfare of the of the platform is uh, strictly uh, increased when firms have uh, the same budgets. So having make contests more equal maximizes uh, welfare. Uh, so welfare means the total, the sum of the firm's objectives and the total users uh, solvers uh, payoffs. Uh, and a third uh, kind of contribution we have is that um, we compare the setting where firms have the same budget now. And now we are looking at what can, uh, uh, what can, uh, so we should have the same budget, okay? What I'm saying now is at the solver level, uh, what can the platform do better? To, uh, so one, one, one setting that's happening now is the system on the left. We have solver self-select uh, self contests. Uh, what can the platform do better uh, to improve uh, this self-selection? So this self-selection is actually inefficient. And we see uh, this is kind of a known result in search. If you have worked on a search problem, uh, you probably know that uh, people self-select into uh, opportunities that are ex ante, have a higher potential. So for example, the AI trend right now may attract a lot uh, more people, insufficiently, uh, inefficiently more people working on AI problems than problems of other societal value uh, because people self-select. Uh, the same happens when solo self-select across contests. So what can the platform do better to improve, uh, alleviate this inefficiency? So we compare the setting where uh, people self-select versus a setting, uh, so people self-select with 50-50 probability you have a stochastic entry versus deterministic entry, so which makes uh, half of the population enter in one contest, half of the rest enter in the other contest. These two settings on expectation are the same. Okay, but uh, how do they compare in terms of welfare in terms of uh, solvers uh, uh, payoff? So the featured contest that we see on the platform essentially attract uh, solvers more to this uh, context. So they kind of uh, simulate the system on the right. So we'll try to give an uh, kind of argument why do we observe so many uh, feature contests? What, what is the value of the feature contest? One way to think of the feature contest is uh, that the platform can nudge, they cannot, uh, the platform cannot enforce the entry of the solvers, but the platform can nudge the entry of the solver to certain contests by featuring uh, some contest to the other. So is this a good practice for the platform? And the answer is uh, yes. We are actually able to show that nudging solvers to certain contests, when the platform separates some sense the solvers to contest is, is strictly better than uh, when, the con when the solvers self-separate themselves, self-select uh, contests. And of course, in the, when, the setting, when the setting scales to infinity, these two uh, will, will become equal, if you are wondering. Uh, so these are the results we have. Uh, Constantinos, uh, yes. so Amar, as what does the nudging look like in practice? How can you apply uh, such a nudging in practice? Right. Uh, so when you have featured contests at the top of the platform, so they attract more uh, solvers than... Uh, in, in some sense, what we are saying is that the platform has incentives to, um, at least for noise-driven contests, the platform has incentives to make a con contest harder to find. So to reduce the discoverability of, of, of contests. Uh, uh, so, so that we can nudge, uh, we can, as a platform, can nudge the demand uh, to certain uh, contests will become everyone Strictly better off. 
Yeah, instead of saying this nudging to a certain contest, maybe can you rephrase this as uh, leveling the participants in contests? It's better. Like, if you, if if one contest ends up being like uh, already popular, you actually want to promote the non-popular one so that solvers, new solvers, will actually tend to participate to that one so that you and you level the number of participants. That's the where, where the the result comes from, right? Uh, so yes, you don't want three, to three to one solvers. The platform can see who has entered where. In some, in, in our set, strictly speaking, in our model, uh, we have a simultaneous setting. Uh, you are thinking of a sequential setting, uh, but in, in some sense, the NADS uh, setting implements an asymmetric, asymmetric equilibrium. There is an asymmetric equilibrium where, half, like, if if the contests are equal. If if the people could talk to each other, they would like to se self separate. Half of them will go to the one, half of the other will go to the other one. But uh, in actuality, people cannot coordinate. So uh, so the full coordinate system is the system on the right. Uh, the system on the left is the so what the platform can uh, operational the way to operationalize this to come back to Ersin's question is by uh, showcase some contest to uh, half of the of the so, so if you have ten solvers half of them and show them one contest. The rest half of them randomly uh, chosen and show them the other the other contest. This, it, by restricting uh, solar citation, uh, actually uh, strictly improves welfare. That's what we're saying. In, yes. Uh, and uh, in the so, paper, we'll uh, try sorry. to... So uh, yes. Anton says is nudging like a recommender system then in your case. Uh, for pro are you thinking of product recommendations or are you thinking of uh... yeah like just bringing uh, some some contests uh, to some sol some specific solvers attention right so exactly like, exactly yeah. so so nudging what we mean by nudging is we draw attention of solvers to specific uh, contests if we can guide uh, as a platform solvers to specific contests this actually tends to be well uh, strictly better off uh, in terms of welfare uh, yeah, that's what we are saying. Uh, and in some sense, this gives incentives for platforms to hide, uh, in some sense, or, or or make it harder. And I will come back to this. Make it harder uh, for uh, solvers to find contests. It turns out to be uh, actually better uh, when someone can guide um, solvers to contests. This is kind of the contribution. And uh, this, so that's an example what I shared with you. Uh, and it's in the introduction of the paper. Essentially, if you understood this, uh, you got the idea of what the paper is about. In the paper, we extend the previous uh, these insights along several dimensions. So we can uh, think about an arbitrary number of solvers. Uh, you can have multiple firms. You can also have the possibility that solvers exert effort uh, to enhance their solution quality because so far there's no effort element, right? It's just noise. And... Uh, in, uh, in an ex extension of the paper, uh, we also have uh, we're also thinking about ability, which is skills uh, that solvers have to enhance, uh, contribute to the solution. So here, what uh, the way to model this is that uh, output of a, of a solver I in contest J is a, a random variable, that's why a capital letter, times uh, the effort that you put I is the solver, J is the contest, to the, to the power of theta. Now, what this theta captures is the sensitivity of the, uh, of the outcome with respect to effort. If theta is zero, outcome is purely noise-driven. Uh, when theta is infinity, very large, uh, the outcome is purely effort-driven. We can have a, a wide range of parameters of theta capturing settings where both effort and uncertainty captures uh, the outcome. Now, the review process, interestingly, pushed us more to uh, understand better the this ZIJ parameter. And uh, we can dis distinguish along two cases of uh, of what what does this ZIJ capture. So there is there are contests, we'd like to categorize contests across two dimensions. Uh, the noise-driven contests, uh, we interpret ZIJ as a noise, and these um, uh, these are settings where ZIJ uh, so so the the solver 
learns x uh, z i j ex post choosing to exert effort in a contest. So the timeline is critical. As a solver, you first select a contest, then you select how much effort you exert, uh, and then you submit your solution. But your solution is being evaluated by an independent expert by the market. That's why uh, uh, your uh, the noise impacts the the ranking of your solution exposed to exert effort. And only afterwards, uh, outputs are realized and winners are selected. Uh, so this uh, captures settings where you have significant uncertainty. It's an open-ended problem, uh, whereas uh, so, so that this uncertainty is key to um, uh, understand the output. Um, so, for example, you don't even know how to even uh, solve the problem. So it's it's an open-ended problem. So that uh, uncertainty should only come after you exert some effort. The set. So Z is a noise driven setting. The noise is uh, coming to play after you exert effort. So you, you want to exert effort, uh, you should account for this. There are also, in contrast, ability driven contests uh, in which uh, uh, you have uh, the ability is uh, the solver learns Z I J fully, privately, before even selecting a contest. This is a skill. In some sense, you know how good you are. You self-select to a uh, cross-competing contest. Okay, this is the key distinction, and I'm will uh, will contribute to both uh, contests. So very quickly, uh, to just to summarize the insights about noise-driven contests, uh, we start with a benchmark of the monopoly. In the monopoly, uh, what we what's kind of known is that uh, when you design your contest, you don't care about participation because it's a monopoly. You have only one contest. There is no nothing else. That's what we call a monopoly. And here. Uh, you uh, allocate the, the optimal contest design is uh, as a firm, you should allocate multiple prizes of equal size. So why uh, equal size? Um, why multiple prizes? Uh, well, uh, the equal prizes, I would say, is kind of expected because uh, people are, it's a symmetric setting. Uh, and multiple prizes, um, it's uh, not, not, uh, not so uh, simple to explain. Uh, in general, this depends on the characteristics of the noise distributions. So uh, many people have contributed to this direction. Uh, Ersin, in particular, Timor Peoglu has uh, a lot of work uh, on the on this uh, on these lines. Uh, so this is the monopolistic uh, setting. Uh, we are interested about the, the oligopolistic or the uh, in general the dwelling uh, setting. The dwelling setting we can show the existence of a symmetric equilibrium at the firm level always. Don't be confused about Two equilibria. There's one, the firm level, firms compete by, uh, we're looking at equilibrium in mechanisms. How do you select uh, price allocation given uh, competing allocations uh, by competitors? So we can show here that the uh, the same insight continues to hold. And uh, in particular, uh, the optimal, the, the equilibrium allocation is uh, has weekly fewer and larger uh, prices compared to monopoly. But uh, we can also show that uh, when theta is zero, when output is purely noise driven, so when effort does not matter, we can show that uh, there's a unique uh, unique equilibrium that uh, is all firms set, uh, allocate when it takes all. And interestingly, all these, uh, in general, whether you set multiple words or not, this uh, depends on the noise distribution and depends also on the theta, on the sensitivity of output with respect to effort. It does not depend on the firm budget. What this implies is a simple corollary of this. If you combine all this, uh, is that for any noise distribution, so what we know from literature is that the noise distribution plays some role to allocate prices. What we can show in the competitive setting is that for any noise distribution you have, because of some, um, uh, because of continuity and because of uniform convergence with respect to allocations, uh, these are kind of some technical reasons. But we can show that essentially when theta is small or uh, positive but small, the effort plays role, not too much. We are close to the noise driven setting. The noise -driven, purely noise driven setting, we know when it takes all is optimal. Close to, uh, we can rigorously say, but close to a noise-driven uh, setting, one price is uh, an absolute on equilibrium in some sense. So 
τα approximately optimal. So you lose at most epsilon uh, by uh, locating one price. And this approximation becomes uh, tighter, much, much better, as uncertainty is more and more, more important in the setting. And guess what? Innovation contests a lot about uncertainty. So if uncertainty is very, very large, the recommendation for, 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 for from our paper is locate one price. Okay, and this is approximately optimal. This is about the noise-driven context. Uh, we also have contribution about the ability-driven context, which to me, uh, I found it very interesting because uh, I have worked on this on this setting. It was kind of a blue ocean, kind of, uh, uh, at least this model uh, generalizes some previous models in a non-expected way, uh, at least to me, because I have worked on this problem quite, quite, quite a while. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, two firms again with different budgets. Now uh, we are assuming that uh, it's an ability-driven contest. So we're assuming people have different abilities, different skills, which uh, affect uh, which contest we select. So think of it, for example, a top coder, which run multiple simultaneous contests. And some of them are about data science, some of them about programming, some of them about design. So as a solver, uh, we um, have uh, different expertise in different settings. So, uh, and, and, and we are thinking about a diverse, diverse uh, platform in the sense that the skills you have in a certain uh, contest may be uh, correlated with the skills you have in another contest. So, how good you are, uh, for example, if you work on a on a modeling paper. Uh, it might be correlated if you work to uh, an experimental paper. You might need some modeling skills. So this correlation of skills uh, of solvers uh, when they allocate themselves across a contest. So we want to capture this uh, inter-contest dependence now uh, by modeling ability of the solvers as a two-dimensional type. Constantinos, sorry, uh, we, we have like around, let's say, five minutes left so that we, we have time left for questions. So if you could wrap up. Uh, yes, I might need uh, two, three more minutes, but uh, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, letting me know. So the idea is that we want to capture dependency of, of contests uh, with, uh, with ability of people. Okay, so we model uh, solvers as a two-dimensional uh, type with private information. So I know my type. Type is a two-dimensional vector. And uh, we have, uh, and, and abilities are different depending on which contest I will select. The question I have for uh, the audience is, which contest would you select uh, when you have different abilities and you don't know the abilities of the others? Abilities are drawn by ID across solvers per contest. Abilities contest uh, my ability in one contest and the ability of the other could be correlated so we have an, a joint distribution so how, how would you self-select yourself uh, into the contest if one contest have a larger budget the other has a smaller budget would you always go to the contest with a larger budget uh, and the answer is that if budgets are equal this setting this is this is a trivial setting right if you have equal budgets one dollar one dollar you have different skills uh, you would, of course, uh, strictly prefer to go to the, and these are winner takes all contest. Of course, you would strictly prefer to go to the contest with uh, that you have the highest skill. But what happens when the firms have unequal budgets? So that's a non-trivial uh, setting, at least to me. Uh, and we're able to show that uh, when budgets are different, you go to the contest with, uh, so you transform your ability with some function. And we are able to solve this separation. In some sense, uh, now the equilibrium looks like you have a boundary function that separates solvers across uh, across contests. And this function um, uh, comes from um, the following intuition. Uh, so it's not so simple to, to explain this in, uh, in one minute, but uh, the structure of the equilibrium is um, the, setting, the setting is very very rich here uh, because uh, we can characterize this. We need to characterize the equilibrium in terms of a function. 
this function gamma uh, separates, uh, explains who goes to which contest. If you are below the gamma uh, boundary, you enter contest two. If you are above, if your ability uh, dimensional types belong to the area above this gamma curve, you go to contest one. And this gamma function actually, uh, again, equates the expected utilities in each contest. And uh, we have a geometric explanation of this phenomenon. It turns out that uh, there is a functional integral differential equation that uh, if you can solve, then you can find this gamma boundary. This, this equation cannot be uh, solved in general, uh, but has some structural properties. And the insight here is that uh, if you change your contest design, shifts the whole function. Uh, it does not just shift one parameter, shifts the whole set. So it's a very different approach to how do you design a contest now. Uh, so I will end uh, this talk with the following uh, question. Uh, are solvers and firms hurt by feature contest that nudge solvers? So again, the same setting. You have two firms, uh, sol equal budgets. Uh, if solvers self-select contests uh, versus I nudge solvers to certain contests. So uh, would uh, so if you you would think that if 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 people have different capabilities and contests themselves are different, you would think and as, as one of our reviewers actually uh, suggested, you would think that uh, letting people self self separate actually uh, would be always strictly better, right? It turns out that it's not always uh, the case. And, and actually, uh, what we are able to show is that nudging solvers to contest strictly improves welfare only if the abilities of the solvers are sufficiently dependent, sufficiently correlated. Uh, so the insight for, uh, for the platform here is that you should nudge solvers to contest if skills of the population are sufficiently positively correlated. Otherwise, you should let solvers self-select themselves. So self-selection is good when the tasks are, uh, I would say, very uh, in, uh, independent. But tasks are very similar. Uh, like if the platform is a lot about data science pro projects, then uh, this creates inefficiency of, of uh, between solvers. So with that, um, uh, I would uh, like to uh, conclude uh, with uh, we contribute to the solver level decision making. How do you select between endogenous outside options? We also contributed to uh, firm level decision making. We also contribute to the platform level decision making uh, with uh, saying that it's actually good to restrict uh, firms. It's actually good to restrict uh, solvers. Too much freedom turns out to be bad uh, here. Uh, letting solvers self-select projects, it turns out to be bad. Letting firms self-select their budgets turns out to har harm uh, uh, harm uh, welfare. And so that, that's about this project and uh, follow-up uh, work uh, of mine, with collaborators Sanjeev Erat from San Diego and Jiva from IE Business School in, in, in Madrid, uh, has a lab experiment to uh, think about this uh, more about uh, uh, on a platform level of we're thinking about equity because uh, so far we're so far looking about efficiency and operations is a lot about efficiency this field is all about efficiency but uh, we're also thinking about other objectives equity uh, because uh, if uh, you have this participation uncertainty uh, many people uh, sometimes they earn money sometimes they don't earn money uh, so they you have high attrition rate in these platforms so these workers uh, in food delivery platforms, for example, in other platforms, they would, platforms should care about equity because about the long-term survival of the platform. So we have a lab experiment currently at, under review, uh, which talks about participation but in a continued fashion. It's not about one shot. So that's one paper. And I'm also working on uh, some other settings, uh, some other modeling. With, with, that, with that, I would like to conclude the, my presentation. Um, I'm open to questions on anything. Thank you very much for uh, any feedback and for your uh, attendance. Thank you very much, Costa. Um, Alex, do you have any questions? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, if not, let me start then uh, with some questions and then uh, maybe it may inspire others. So um, I would like to follow on the nudging part a bit. Right. Uh, first of all, I must say, I think this is a really interesting paper. Actually, it, it's, it's, it tackles really difficult uh, issues, like in terms of technicality. And when I read it, it's like it's actually like a combination of three papers. Unfortunately, that's what you need to do nowadays to publish <laughs> the hard top journals, right? Uh, but so yeah. let me let me ask about nudging with it. So uh, right now, the belief structure is like that, right? So uh, I choose a contest, right? I'm mixing, of course, uh, in equilibrium with some probability, and I choose a contest. But I don't know exactly how many solvers chose that contest with me. And then depending on my uh, belief or like uh, kind of kind of this random number of uh, participants, I determine an effort. That's how it works, right? Okay. So, uh, okay. So then how do these beliefs work in the nudging case? Like, let's say I'm nudged to a certain contest. Let's say there are 200 solvers that I know right, that, that can potentially participate in two contests, and I am nudged into one contest. Then do I assume that, oh, like half of them will be nudged into one contest and the other half will be nudged into the other? So I now, do I have any expectation about the number of participants now? Uh, do, do I know that it's like uh, it's hundreds, or do I still have the same kind of beliefs, oh, like people will select randomly? But overall, in the end, uh, because of the nudging, people will end up uh, choosing an equilibrium where like 100 ended up in one contest and 100 in the other contest. Uh, so how is the belief structure here? Uh, yeah, yeah, G -g great uh, question, Ersin, and thank you for, your, for the kind words. Uh, the, the idea is that um, in the, the system on the left, uh, people select contests with a binomial probability, 50-50, right? So here you have uh, uncertainty on the participation uh, so you don't know as a solver, you select contest A with a probability 50-50. Uh, you don't know how many others will select. So it could be if you have four, as you have three competitors, you may end up from zero competitors all the way to three competitors. System on the right, uh, when you are nudged, uh, is an equilibrium actually to follow the nudge uh, because you know uh, you're going to have one uh, competitor. So switching, so let's assume you are one solver. So look at the system on the right on the screen. Have four uh, solvers. Two of them uh, are nudged to contest B. Uh, you are one of these two nudged to contest A. If you switch, your belief is that there will be two others. Uh, versus if you stay, you're going to have one other. So uh, you are actually, it's an equilibrium. The system on the right implements an asymmetric equilibrium. Uh, which can only be uh, achieved through some coordination with the platform. Otherwise, uh, we cannot have this equilibrium uh, by the solves themselves. So in terms of beliefs, uh, you know, on the system on the right, you have no participation uncertainty in some sense. You know how many competitors you're going to have. And this is uh, strictly better in terms of solvers and in terms of uh, aggregate welfare. That's what we are saying. Actually, for the ability-driven case, the insight we have is that it's not always strictly better. It's, it's strictly better if correlation, if the, if the abilities between solvers are highly correlated, sufficiently correlated, then you should not. If uh, abilities are independent or not so much uh, correlated, and then uh, you should pe let people self-select. And we actually have a characterization with an example in the paper that has, uh, uh, has a particular dependent structure uh, from, uh, from copula. So if you have copulas, you can uh, really uh, operationalize this uh, dependent structure. We can have an if and only if condition in an example in the paper. So uh, I guess in a manner of speaking, that's, to me, that sounds more like a load management, right? Uh, it's not like uh, I need one solver in a particular contest. It's about I, I want kind of kind of uh, equal load around different contests. And I know solvers to know that kind of 
kind of load sharing rather than randomly selecting between them. So that's what nudging is about. So I think this is kind of important because if you go to the the uh, heterogeneous case, and I, I, it's my follow up question, right? This is the heterogeneous so, case. Yes. Yeah, like when you have a heterogeneous case, now whether you actually specifically point solvers to a certain contest or whether you are trying to load manage, that's going to differ, right? Actually, you may end up nudging a solver with, uh, let's say, an ability in the other contest, right? Let's say in contest two to a contest one, and that would be worse. But if you try to load manage, maybe they will self select to a better equilibrium than what you would do because you don't observe as the platform. Right, who is better at what? So, have you thought about that kind of uh, load management, or that, like, uh, are you specifically looking at a uh, kind of a targeted nudging, where even if like an ability of solver is ends, ends up uh, being for another's contest, I direct uh, it to one contest because I don't know as the platform, I have no idea about the abilities, right? Uh, yeah, great question. If I understood it correctly, uh, the the idea is that, and I think that was the intuition of the review team. Uh, from management science is, and I, and I think this, this is a fair point because it's a non result in matching theory. But uh, matching, uh, you should let them, uh, uh, if you let them self, 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 self select, it will be actually strictly better. So, this kind of uh, counterintuitive that by nudging you could get, uh, you can get uh, uh, an efficiency improvement. That's why uh, the review team asked us to introduce more heterogeneity uh, in the set, in the setting. In the ability-driven uh, case, where people have different skills and contests have uh, different uh, ability distributions, so have heterogeneous contests, heterogeneous skills, uh, you would expect that uh, nudging uh, to not work when. Uh, the settings are uh, the, the, the the contests are very. Uh, they are not so much dependent. So if uh, you have very like you have a contest about biology, you have a contest about mathematics. Your skill in biology and mathematics is entirely different. Okay, self selection there we know very well from matching theory. Self selection there uh, works better than uh, letting them match to contest because if we the way we implement we operationalize matching exactly as we are suggesting. Uh, will uh, eventually allocate a guy who doesn't know anything about biology to the math contest, and the biologist and the mathematician to the biologist contest. So, of course, if you do it this way, uh, you can easily see that it uh, would be bad. But if the contest, uh, if, if your skills cross across contests, the inter-contest dependency is high, then uh, Turns out that nudging, uh, not what, how do you implement nudging? You sell, sell, sell as a platform. You select half of the population at random, and you send them to one contest. You you show them only one contest in some sense. So and and this gives another way to think of this nudging result is again that uh, uh, gives explains why so many platforms, not all platforms, but many platforms would like to hide content uh, from uh, you hide or make it difficult to find. So uh, I have in mind, for example, Shopify, Substack, uh, Teachable, uh, in contrast with Amazon, Medium, or uh, or Udemy. So like, uh, uh, what I mean here is that uh, Shopify, uh, Substack, for example, etc., uh, they try to make it easy for, uh, for solvers to find uh, content, whereas uh, Sorry, uh, so if I try to make it hard for solvers for for these users to find content, whereas Amazon, uh, Udemy, Medium try to uh, help uh, the buyers, the sellers, uh, to improve the efficiency. So why why do why these platforms have uh, observe this difference in the in the in the behavior? So this is much more broader than innovation contest, okay, but. Our setting says that uh, we can apply this to you know, innovation contests, either by featuring contest or by uh, setting you have many, many, many contests and many, many solvers. The platform has an active role to play to improve the matching of uh, talent 
uh, to uh, problems in some sense. This is relevant also for how do you allocate uh, grants uh, or like how do you let people uh, self-allocate to grants and many, many, many other innovation settings come, come to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just uh, maybe my suggestion would be actually about that would be, uh, I mean, given that the real issue is uh, is that if if you if you end up a very in a very unbalanced set of solvers in contests, that's a very bad thing because of diminishing returns and both from a shock perspective and effort perspective, right? Uh, you want to avoid that by nudging. So I, I'm I I think like you can try maybe a few different options like kind of limiting the number of participants in both contests, like to so that you don't end up in a very unbalanced situation. Like people will limit the number of probabilities that can happen, right? Uh, given the number of solvers. So, so that's going to like reduce the probability set. That's going to reduce randomization. And therefore, you may end up improving the problem without having to eliminate self-selection, right? Uh, so I think that direction could be really nice in terms of uh, the contribution because I really like this, uh, this type of analysis of like, oh, how do you actually manage this given that they, people have different abilities, right? Anyway, uh, mm -hmm. I think we are uh, the time is up. Uh, if you want to discuss later, I would be happy to. Uh, yes. So, yeah, I'll just leave the floor to uh, Ruba. And, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Ersen. Thanks a lot, Kostas, for the really nice talk and Ersen for the very nice discussion. Uh, and thank you all for being here. We'll uh, see you in two weeks' time for a talk by Jankun Sand from uh, Imperia. Thank you.